Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. If you're passionate about the tactical skirmish game that brings together strategy, lore, and creativity, you are in the right place. Don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe, and stay updated with our latest episodes. If you want to support the show, check out our Patreon. Your support means a lot to us. Follow us by using the social media links in the podcast description for all the latest news, and be sure to leave a review to let us know what you think. Thanks for tuning in. Here's today's episode. In today's episode, we open up the voice chat to the public in the Discord server. Um, Anyone that wanted to could hop in and just let us know the hype they're feeling. Unfortunately, Travis was not able to make it today, but we do have several guests among the listeners. Please enjoy. Right off the bat... I'm here with Ted, who was on a while ago, chatting about Hyrotech Circle. Um, but now we've got all of the the rules for all of the teams here. We can look at all the third edition rules. How excited are we today? I'm super stoked. It's the first thing I saw basically when I woke up this morning, and I like my productivity for the day just died. So. Yeah, I'm kind of glad it came out on a Wednesday because this is my chillest day of the week and I'm pretty much just digging through everything and having conversations. It's a very exciting day. Yeah, every time you get a new like release set is always a big day, especially for a new edition like this. And especially for Kill Team, which is obviously the best game. Right. I mean, they don't make other games for this universe, so it's it's good that the the one that's actually worth playing is, is getting such a sweet rules update. Yeah. Uh, so how are you feeling about your number one go-to faction, Hyrotech Circle? Um, there's a lot of ups. There's a couple things I'm a little, um, hesitant about, but overall, like, some really cool changes. The team lost, um, a lot of its, like, crazy action efficiency, where, like, all of our free comms and stuff are, are now, you know, cost one APL, or one AP. But a lot of the, a lot of the gotchas got taken away out of the team, um, and I think that's good. Like, it's way harder to be like, hey, I'm just going to throw this giant super blast up onto a vantage that you can't really see coming. Um, but a lot of their other stuff got strengthened. Uh, reanimation is, I think reanimation is a side grade, but it's a solid side grade. And living metal is super good. I'm all, I'm very enthused by the fact that the little reanimator bug can pick someone up in the middle of a turning point. Yeah, and not only can you pick something up in a turning point, if you spend two APL with it, it's an automatic reanimation. It's not like you don't have to roll three plus. So, And if they haven't activated yet mid-activation, they can still activate. Yeah. Um, it's also very exciting that um, everyone, every single Necron that gets incapacitated becomes a reanimation token. So you can't just like outpace the killing and then make them not reanimate which just like did not make any sense at all honestly um so now it's just like yeah. if, if you go hard and a bunch of people die they can all still stand back up anyways um yeah and the bugs seven inch super conceal uh pretty swift z- zipping around kind of compensates for the fact that they don't fly anymore i'm pretty sure yeah the seven inch move is i think the um we also as a team got one of those sweet sweet um dash st- start of turn dash strategic ploys uh in command underlings where you can choose models visible to them within six of a crypt tech or the apprentice tech and they get a free dash um which combined with the five inch move and give, gives the team a lot of positioning it's kind of what's that uh or uh, commandos ploy the sh- shush ploy shush yeah so it kind of gives them like a shush equivalent which i think is going to be a huge tech piece um especially since like the death mark lost its its teleport in and we don't get um the three inch extra on the chronometron anymore so our movement shenanigan shenanigans still exist but they shifted yeah they're like completely reflavored yeah like the we have that like the warp coven had that uh teleport spell and we basically have that on the chronomancer instead of the increased speed 
Yeah, so they they kind of like are not necessarily such a like slow faction anymore. Um, like their individual movement is a little slower, but they've got they've got tools to to get around. Yeah, they always kind of did. I mean, the death mark being able to teleport in and then just being able to turn the whole team to six inch move on engage um, still kept them good. But they're definitely, I think, a little faster now, which which feels pretty sweet. Yeah. Um, like the psychomancer is largely the same except for conjure trauma so i'm really stoked about that oh also his his old man stick is way better um all the crypt techs went up to four attacks on their melee weapons which makes them way more capable of like parrying out or even like going in and you know old man uh walking stick something to death especially with the capability to have accurate too if you are fighting without moving a lot um, yeah, and like yeah. ganging up on people. So like if someone charges a crypt tech and then you charge in with a, another immortal or something and, uh, join the fight, they, they'll fight you off decently. Well, they still probably don't really want to aggress in melee, but they can, mm-hmm. they can like hold their ground in melee. Well, I mean, like crypt techs, the, I mean, the psychomancer used to not be capable of like killing a guardsman in melee. It was a, it was a three attacks, two, three profile. Yeah, it took him the whole game to kill a guardsman. <laughs> just, yeah, just miserable. Um, so yeah, going to 4-4 four, four with four attacks and devastating one on a melee weapon, which is something we hadn't seen before. So that's that's a cool thing, because I think we were talking about that um, the other day with some like homebrew goofiness we were doing um, on our local Discord. And so seeing devastating on a melee weapon that it actually like you can retain hits and just deal those crits in is an interesting design space to have because I don't think there was any melee weapons with just like mortal wounds before. Uh, yeah, I don't think there was. It was pretty much like the closest thing was the legionary uh, wizard guy, the sorcerer. When you retain crits, you immediately deal uh, mortal wounds. So this is oh, pretty much right. just yeah, like turned into a turned into something turned into a keyword like that's how it mm-hmm. it works to have a devastating keyword in melee, um, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, the I think the slimming down and focus on keywords has been really good for this edition as well. Um, there's a couple things that I've seen that I could have still gotten the keyword. Oh, there's what was that ability? Like having an ignore obscuring keyword would have been probably reasonable with the amount of stuff that gets that. Yeah. Um, and there's a couple there's a couple more things that I'm like, this could have been a keyword or a, or like a feel no pain keyword. There is like four different versions I've seen of damage reduction still. Yeah, those definitely both should have been keywords. Um, uh, also, there's there's like a weird number of things that like rules that basically act like another rule and are missing the name. But then it actually means like they stack. Um, so like one of my, one of the big examples that stand out for me is hand of the archon, uh, have from darkness death. And that is like, if you, if someone is not a valid target, uh, at the start of an activation, you choose them to mark for from darkness death. And then when you attack them, you can upgrade a normal to a crit. And that actually becomes better than severe because if you roll a crit, then severe doesn't trigger. But then with, with this, uh, from darkness death, if you roll a crit, you oh, still get yeah. to upgrade another one to a crit. And if you were severe, that would still trigger too. So I haven't really like dove around to see if they also have severe. I mean, I don't think they do. I think it's just like if they if their rules were written around the severe keyword, their combo of like triple crit in melee every time they fight would have fallen apart. So they needed this other thing. Um, but sure. the fact that that kind of stuff comes up a couple times, I'm like, maybe they should have just like made a keyword for it. But also maybe <laughs> not. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, the flex on that. Um, let's see, looking around. The, so yeah, the Psychomancer hasn't changed a lot. The Chronomancer has some differences. Like, Chronometron is very different. It's much more of a defensive ability. Nanomine actually went back up to six inches, but it's two inches off the move stat, so it's that bigger bubble. But it's not the, like, your dashes and, and everything are all get completely tanked. It's just you're a little slower moving. So it has a wider control area again, but it's not as suffocating, I guess, is is the word I'll use here, which which is good because I think the double nerf that they took before was maybe a little more than it needed. Like it it needed more of this one or the other treatment. And I think this is a fine place for it. And then, they, yeah, and like they got that whole like swap around the Technomancer got a huge facelift, which considering that 50 millimeter base was was big. 
it doesn't do an extra res anymore, but it's six attack bolt gun has rending now. Yeah. Um, that's a pretty big deal. <laughs> so does it's three, five, four attack melee weapon. Um, the, the repairability is three D three instead of two D three. So if you're, if you're healing something like that, it's better now. Like if you don't kill a Necron in, um, in this edition, it's, it's going to be a lot. Yeah. I mean, um, honestly, like the, the previous one for two D three is like not even worth an action point. It's like you, you, you could possibly heal someone for only two and you spent a action point on your cryptek to do that. So like, yeah. 3d3 i'm like that's like if you only get three that's pretty feels bad but i mean that the odds of that are pretty insanely low so I on mean, average it's, it's like six or seven he- wounds back yeah and since most yeah. of your people have 10 wounds yeah. um they usually if they're like at three or below they're probably dead so it it's depends. like you know i mean there's I guess they're a little bit of, like, one HP gang. The math can take them there, because, like, if, you know, three three damage hits go through, they're on one. But, like, yeah. you know, like, pretty pretty often, six or seven is going to put you back to full health, um, yep. which is definitely worth it, because if you can just go to full health, then it doesn't trigger your uh, reanimation once per game use on that model. Yep. Yeah, no, that's that's pretty big. They also got an offensive ability, which now the Technomancer can give one operative, lethal five, rending, saturate, or severe, any two of those. It's um, any so two you of can, those. Yeah, so you can put lethal five and rending on your death mark, which now has severe as well, and has devastating two. Gross. Yeah. Uh, also, on that note, James is here. Hey, Welcome back. Sorry. <laughs> just, I've been just hiding, listening. I just like listening and talking kill team, so yeah, don't mind sneaky, me. Sneaky orc guy. Yes. I, I mean Jason, you're out you're outnumbered by uh com- by orc avatars in this chat now though. Yeah. <laughs> yep, Xenos in general. Um yeah, we chatted a little bit about commandos last week, but uh if there's any other like big, especially like new things you've learned, cool highlights, uh things that stand out in the context of seeing more faction rules that you want to throw out there, James, you're welcome to. Uh novitiates right now okay. are my big one. All right. Uh, first first team I opened up for the rules this morning at five AM was uh Blades of Cane and I quickly closed that down. So Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, F, F in the chat for Novitiates. It's for uh, Blades. And for Blades for sure. But no Novitiates to me are huge winners. Just from an initial once over. I, I think you go from having stuff that you never took to okay, so I have to drop that now are you sure i have to drop that so i mean your flamers went up to four four damage hitting on twos still an eight inch range still torrent still saturate but now we're four four damage do they have any other i haven't like done that much of a deep dive on novitius yet do they have any other like equipment or ploys that further accelerate the flamers they not ex- well, so they have a dash team wide that you could do from turning point two onward, but you have to end your move closer to your closest enemy operative or objective marker. I think there are a couple of conditions, so you can still set up um, some safe things turn one that they may not see. But then each one of the pergati, the flamers, they can spend the in- blazing inferno or the new blaze firefight ploy they have for free when they activate yeah. blazing so inferno the, your is okay. nuts that's what inferno should have been the in second edition yeah yep. run us through what that yeah, blazing I mean, inferno is um so blazing inferno i believe um, just pull it up to be sure it's almost like a stun effect right you give you roll a d6 or 2d6 on a seven up you choose what happens if you don't roll a seven your opponent chooses what happens Either they lose their, uh, their like flame, the inferno token or the blaze token, or they lose an APL and keep the blaze token for the next for that whole turn. So it, it makes it's more decisions that you're forcing your opponent to have to make, and it's actually a functional special rule versus what it was previously. And then the blazing, the inferno token does a D three damage every time the uh, opponent would activate that character. Yep, inflict D three damage on it. Wow, which is which is so much better than on a crit. There's a fifty fifty chance of doing one. 
<laughs> on a crit, put a token on it, and at the end of the turn, roll for a four up. Yeah. Like you might get lucky. Yeah. It's terrible. But now you've made it deal where uh it's they have to make and I mean not well, hang on now. I don't see where it says that anymore. I thought you had to roll something. Nope. No, it's just oh, it's, it's controlling. You can, you can choose. You can just choose to do it. Yeah, sorry, my bad. No dice, <laughs> except to figure out your D three damage. Yeah. Whoopsie. It is a ploy though, so it's cost CP when you're not doing it for free. <clears throat> yep. But that also means more. I guess it's only when you're using the Minotaurum Flamer. Never mind. Hmm. I still like it, but you should only ever be using it for free. You know what I mean? Right. The because the preceptor used to have be able to put those on there, but it looks like she can't anymore. No, the preceptor now gives a three inch bubble of severe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a three inch radius severe bubble. That's um, super good. Hang the, out with the crossbow lady. <laughs> So that's that's where I was moving next. If y'all if y'all have not looked at the cross at the condemner, go look at the condemner because I that is in the running at least to me for the best sniper so far. There's no heavy restriction on it. You're running around with full movement with a three three devastating two silent weapon. Yeah, and, and you're crits. actually yeah, and then oh yeah, piercing crits too. And Plus then all of your, you've got like, faith Yep, all your faith points. I was going to say that too. That got simplified too. It, you don't have nine options worth of faith points to do. You got three: uh, one to re-roll a die, two to turn a hit into a crit, and three to turn a fail into a hit. That's it. So it's less mental load on the player piloting than of issues. So turning a fail into um, a hit is the most expensive one. Mm-hmm. But that, you know, let's look at it though. They hit on fours. You're gonna if you spike. Oh, great! I get to just turn one of those into a crit if I need to. But I think that's where they're kind of baking in the reliability to the team. Is okay. You're you know baseline. You're gonna hit on fours typically. So have yeah. fun. A lot of the more specialized ones. It looks like. Um, are do hit on threes like the condemner hits on threes, the exactor does, yep. The, yep. the duelist does, mm-hmm. yeah. But so then, the like your preceptor, yep. four, four, five, uh, four attacks hit on fours, five, five. But I mean, that thing's a, a tank potentially, especially with the new defenders of the faith where you're having the first source of damage you take. Hey, man, that team got beefy. They definitely changed yeah. around a lot because there's a lot of the things that they had that were really good that like completely changed or went away. But then there's like plenty of things that they didn't have that have appeared. So ultimately, I feel like yep. they um, I mean, my first impression is that it really it does still like capture the essence and the vibe of the team really well. Uh, they look pretty solid. Um, like faith points is is good enough. And especially with all those specialists hitting on threes that like the combination of your important characters hitting on threes and faith points is going to make them actually pretty potent. Yeah, they lost yeah. the like turbo plasma guns superior. Uh, yeah, good and the superior gain an APL. Oh, I didn't that's, see that yet. That's a three APL superior right there. Um, and the dialogus, your comms, holy smokes. You're you're going to have so much board coverage with that operative on what you want to do with your APL now, because it has a, uh, I think it has a sermon token that you put out within eight inches of it for free, which is zero AP, uh, it's a zero cost action, and you can give an APL within six inches of the condemner or six inches of the token. Yep. Also, that token makes it so enemy operatives within three can't reroll uh on yeah. shooting or fighting yep and they so can't that's... kill the token you can just nope. move it up yeah i mean they can kill her uh sure. which removes the token <clears throat> yep and but then... you can move the token independently of moving her true which i i think that becomes your your bigger play there because suddenly she can sit further back in safety 
move that token up, allowing you to still, you know, push forward an AP, like a comms threat. So, the, so. yeah, the she doesn't look like I don't how many of their abilities are support because we were talking in um some some other hero tech players and I on command point were talking about support with the comms, the comms, the comms equipment thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Is so like support the, the, because the, if that support that's nuts. The her handout APL is support, but the the Vox isn't. But the um, who is it? The Preceptor is support. The no, three inch, the three inch no, severe bubbles. Yes, it is. So you can get a you get that. I mean, you're spending an equipment point for a six inch Holy bubble around one operative. But uh. That's while kind of while it's controlling that comms point, but still, if, if you throw that on a wow, um, I did not yeah. catch that one. We were talking about that with um with Hero Tech because all of the Technomancer's abilities and most of the Chronomancer's abilities are support. So with the wow. with the so with the Technomancer, you can put that comms token down like basically kind of near the middle of the board, and because it's one inch from the token. That's 20 millimeters plus um, a 50 millimeter base plus the six inches plus the three inches. It's like a 13 inch bubble around the center of that token from that center point in the board that your Technomancer can just run around and heal and throw heals and buffs. And then honestly, a cool hobby opportunity, make a little like obelisk looking thing. And then that like yeah. looks like Necron vibes and then uh, mm-hmm. use that as the token. Just, you know, for the cool vibes. I'm all about that kind of stuff. Like, all the teams that are going to, like, do things with equipment and, like, do their specialized takes, like, make your own yeah. custom cool tokens. I think that's going to pop up. I think it's going to be cool. I definitely want to so, make a little, like, Necron, like, grav booster uh, ladder token thing. Oh, that'd be cool. That that would be awesome. Like, little, like, gravity jump pad, like an Unreal or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the precept or not the preceptor, the penitent, right? She can attack four times in an activation. Four fight actions. Uh, wait, who does that? The penitent. You have to pair her up with the exactor. You use the whip lady to whip the penitent, giving yourself the extra inch. But when you do that, it allows them to perform a free fight action after they perform a fight action. Right? So you charge in, fight somebody. I'm sorry, you're not charged in. The, the only way it works is if you're, uh, I think you have to already be engaged to somebody. But you can fight once, use the free fight that's triggered from the exactor that says every time you perform a fight action, you can perform a free fight action. Then you charge to another group and you perform your second fight action with the penitent and then perform another free fight action because of the exact. Ooh. Yeah. And it's ceaseless and when it fights. You use the, and it's ceaseless, but it gets better if you use uh, the faith points ploy where you're healing every action that you use faith points in. Oh, Lord. Like uh huh. You 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 see it now. She's yeah. not losing health when she's going in and fighting people. I mean, she may, but okay. I charge in. Maybe I spend three points on a crit or to make one of my fails a hit, and now I've got three hits. I yep. hit him with one. He hit me back. I hit him with the other. The action ends. I restore three damage. The emperor protects. <laughs> <laughs> That, yeah. that team has me pretty pretty interested. I was already interested in them going into it, and I have a paint scheme in my mind that I've wanted to put into action for a while. So um, I hate painting flesh, so I'm not. I'm going to paint all of their masks or their faces to look like their bronze, like, statue masks. We have and, a local uh, that actually did that, and it looks really cool. I think he did, like, okay, gold that, silver masks, but it looks super sick. That, and it's that it's that mentality, right? So it's going to be like gray robes with orange accents and stuff. I just use the kill team colors because I don't like to think. Um, <laughs> and then do like a copper or brass face plate for it. I think that's going to look nasty. Yeah, 
I agree. That does sound that does sound awesome. What have you liked so far, Jason? Well, you know, obviously I'm a huge fan of Space Marines and Elites just, you know, living that simple vanilla life like that. Uh, I think they're going to be so explosively popular that, you know, I can't help but play a few games, but maybe I'm going to try to do something else till they cool down a little bit, which is what I did last time that Space Marines were pretty pretty hot in the meta. Um Mm-hmm. I have been looking at Phobos a bunch because, I don't know, I feel like maybe they're the the hipster space marines that I crave. But uh, there's there's a lot of changes there, and, the, like, especially with the new Into the Dark maps, like, there's every... It's like, they, they kind of sterilize Into the Dark a little bit because it's like every single map yep. has a long room and two short rooms, and every single map has two doors between the drop zones, and there's not, like, a single instance where a single door in the middle is like a decided factor, um, which is, you know, th- there was definitely some, some like abuse that was kind of ripe with having a single door between drop zones, but also just the fact that it's a 100% always two doors makes it incredibly sterile. Um, and That's fair. yeah. And then like some of the stuff is, is kind of toned down. And like, I feel like incursors are going to just be, full-blown terrible on Into the Dark now. Like, terrible as in, like, they don't work and they lose the game, uh, for right. example. So I've kind of been... It's... I mean, everything is so shuffled up that it's it really is just deep dive all these factions, figure out a new thing. Um, so, I mean, like, good old Angels of Death, fun, classic. Uh, it's simple, because I... I mean, I've got a team sitting right here that is just... Three intercessor warriors, uh, what's four intercessor warriors, the gunner and the sergeant, and they all just have ambiguous looking bolt rifles. Um, that, you know, fun, easy to run. Uh, maybe scouts, maybe Hand of the Archon. Um, I, I played Hand of the Archon for a little while last edition. They were pretty fun. They look pretty similar to how they did before, but shuffled around a little bit. Um, there's still a team that has, they can have two instances of piercing two. Wow. The dark lance is not unwieldy anymore. So, um, with all of their shenanigans, you could basically dash around a corner, blast someone with a pain token that you can start the game with and use from darkness death so that you probably kill whatever you're shooting. Cause you can use your pain token to gain ceaseless, uh, darkness death to get crits and then just obliterate someone, and then if like, whoever, whatever you killed, you use that pain token to immediately dash back to where you came from. So oh, man. you have like an insanely mobile um, pop tart dark lance, which pretty much can provide covering fire for your entire team. Honestly, that's a big threat right there. I mean, just any any actual piercing two threats that you have that are reliable. I mean, it's. Uh, coming from a, someone whose main team has no sources of piercing reliably, I'm, I'm envious. Yeah, seems pretty strong. Um, the blast pistol seems like a blunder to take. I mean, I, I guess you can still move fast and shoot someone, but it's it's basically a piercing two bolt gun, bolt pistol at this point, because it's three, four damage and mm. piercing two. Um, but since you can only have two of these dark light weapons, I feel like you just take the blaster and the dark lance. Uh, someone could probably talk me out of that, but that's my first impression. And then the whole way that I was playing Hand of the Archon in the last edition looks like it would carry over pretty well. Uh, which is every single model on the team can become just an explosive melee threat when they have four attacks, lethal five, rending, darkness death. Uh, it's pretty much just you pounce on someone and you get like three or four crits and uh, it's it's insane. It's it, like part of the reason it worked before was eight wounds and a six up feel no pain means like chainswords just barely don't kill you. And it's like amazingly consistent. Yep. Um, so without having that, it kind of falls apart um, on the, the durability because you just need that like one extra wound. I would ruin break points for sure. Ruin math. So now that you you cut, so did they lose the 
uh, I mean, feel no pain seem like they're gone across the deal. So yeah, but they they yeah. don't have anything to just like reduce damage coming in. They have a version of it, which is it's the same as all the other feel no pains, which is just like for every damage die you take, you get a feel no pain, and for the hand of the archon, <laughs> it's a six up. So it's like if mm. if it takes two dice to kill you, you roll two dice, and you need one of them to be a six to have the same kind of survivability they had before. And before it was like you roll eight dice, and one of them needs to be a six, so you pretty much get it every time. Um, but now yeah. that you'll only get two dice if you're hit with chain swords, you're just gonna buckle and die all the time, and then that makes that one not really worth taking. And one of the big problems that Hand of the Archon had before was they had trouble ramping up in the first place because you couldn't, you didn't have any way to start with pain tokens. Um, but now one of the combat yeah, drugs that you can take... You couldn't get the engine go. Yeah. So now one of the combat drugs you can take is just, like, you get a team-wide... Your team's on drugs, and you can just, like, anyone that's on this drug, you can give a pain token to for free. Um, which, amusingly, could synergize with your warrior, who, when someone gets a pain token the warrior also gets a pain token. So then if you take that combat <laughs> drug, you give a pain token to your Dark Lance, and then your warrior gets one as well. Uh, so then essentially you start the game with two pain tokens, and your your warrior can then move dash, do something, which is, I guess, less important on turn one now that there's not such pressure to score immediately. Or, yeah, so like, you know, extra pain token on the warrior just to do whatever... Uh, you can save it for later. It's not like an APL. They're over here sharing needles. Exactly. <laughs> how very, how very Drukari of them. Oh man, we gotta get them to the Method One Clinic. <laughs> so I, I just watched Arrested Development with my wife, so that oh, no. stuck in my mind. The um, no, I uh. And I apologize. I know Jason's name. I didn't catch your name. I'm Ted. Ted. Okay. I'm James. James. Um, Sweet. Yeah. Ted uh, or Balzer is most of the community has seen me. Have y'all set up any of the maps? I've played half of the game so far on Sunday. Um, but we played on Into the Dark. And the one thing I noticed was it was so fast to set that board up. So fast. It's so nice having preset maps. It makes it so much faster to just throw down terrain. I, I am super bad about like quadruple guessing my terrain placement when I'm building boards. So having something that I can just put down and everyone is like, okay, we're good. Huge help. Uh I well even that, but like you know, into the dark for me, I usually do as my first uh, first round from the tournaments. So when okay. it bra it's breaking it down in between, I'm not having to put it all together. So actually getting set up, I had that map built, and we played map two on into the dark. And man, we had that deal built in less than five minutes, which. There were times where people could take upwards of 10 minutes getting it into the dark board setup. I feel like we're going to get games going a lot faster this expansion. Like getting started from the starting blocks and getting to where we're actually in the middle of it. We're not going to lose so much time to the yeah. setup stage. Yeah, the the game really, really does start up and, and play faster just because it's like... By default, you just take all of your faction equipment, and if you aren't going to do that, you probably know ahead of time because you looked at it, and you're like, wow, and then you find all the synergies, and then you'll be like, oh, this one sucks, I don't want that, I'll take barricades instead. Um, so it's it's kind of just like, that stuff is all solved ahead of time, so you just look at the board, you choose your faction, you stick with the equipment you already have, um, you probably already have a plan for your tack op. And you probably already have a plan for your gambit, just like the the context of the game makes it so easy to just like have that ahead of time. And, you know, maybe part of that is is I am personally way more experienced with the game. So it's like, you know, I'm I'm already like kind of accustomed to going into the game with those kinds of plans. But I feel like yeah. the core rules like especially highlight that and make it especially easy. Um, so it's just like from when you when you sit down to when you launch the game, you do like two things instead of like 30, it feels like. Yep. I think yeah. it's going to be that much easier to streamline new players into it, too. 
yeah. right? Because we're not we're not going to have to go in and explain. Okay, this is because this, and we do this at this, and this at this. It really is now five steps. Do this, do this, do this, do this, and go. So I, I'm thrilled. So that's far. a great change. Yeah, the I think the the equipment is definitely for like, for like the barricades is definitely an interesting step to me. So that'll be that'll be pretty cool. But uh I mean, and just looking at like wacky things we can do with the new the new equipment, but I mean for me <laughs> toward, towards the end of the edition, I was always already kinda like, okay, already I know what three tack ops I'm running. And I know what equipment oh, yeah. I was running, but that's after, you know, eight, ten months of playing oh. the same team. Um Dude, I was going in three three years worth of experience with Commando. <laughs> yeah. It was, um, it was very much like, yep, yeah, here's my team. Do you need me to tell you who I'm taking? Okay, I took this boss instead of this one. I left this right. boy at home. Yeah. Now I actually have decisions to make, which I'm excited for. It, the, I, I mean, love that they... I love that they gave all like the base warrior models like a little special ability that okay. makes them interesting. They're more they're more efficient, right? Mm -hmm. They they're more efficient at some aspect of your team. So now I, I'm excited. I couldn't do it, couldn't test it out against Brood Brothers because he took a Magus, but I'm I'm going all in on stun for my orcs, the next person I play. And I hope to hell it is like a Nemesis Claw or someone that doesn't ignore APL mods. Because I'm going to take three stun grenades at them. I mean, yeah, you, you can stay away. You, you can stay way over there and keep away from my poor robots. <laughs> no, no APL mod ignoring for y'all. Yeah, no, you. you we just woke up. You, you you leave us alone. Yeah, pretty much like ignore APL game wide. Pretty much went away. Um, amusingly, Angels of Death can take that as a chapter tactic, and for anyone that feels inclined yeah, to take yeah. that as a like going into a game chapter tactic, probably want to save that one for your flex choice so that you can uh, enjoy two two traits <laughs> that will be more helpful, and then activate that one when you need it. When you need it, for sure, yeah. But, I mean, that's, it's good that they have it, because the elite teams that don't have something to mitigate that, that's going to yeah. be tough. <laughs> Which is, like, the rest of them. So, honestly, like, there's, there's like, more stealth tools to kill elites than we ever probably expected before, because now, like, stun mm -hmm. is going to wreck their day. Piercing 2 wrecks their day, but we have always known that. Um, power swords will wreck an elite's day. We've kind of already known that, but... You know, let's just like revisit that now that there's way less piercing two. Well, there's also yeah, there's only like four sources of piercing two or something like that in the game now. Wow. Well, but so power swords might do okay into your twelve wound Phobos chassis, but that's not going to yeah. cut it into your fourteen wounds. It is. Uh, a, it is pretty anymore. good into fourteen wounds, like especially if you can, if you can like ding someone and then hit them with a power okay. sword, they're done for. Or like you I'm know, still playing in a space too much marine. second edition thought, I think, where I'm thinking I I just have to kill something in one activation, so I have to break yeah. myself of that mindset. It's just not a thing against marines, yeah. Unless you get a melt a gun right up next to them or something. And like even then, it's not nearly as reliable as people think. Because I mean, I've been playing just intercessors on engage for like years, and it is it is just like. Your las gun will like surprisingly often do like five damage, and then like another one does like five damage, and now all of a sudden I've got four wounds left, and you kill me with a bayonet, and like that kind of stuff comes up all the time. So so don't be afraid to just have your like engage with your piddly weapons because they are better than you think. It's they're they're kind of unreliable, but like in a pinch they'll get you, they'll get you through. It's not like the main thing to rely on, but it is like. And, and there, I'm sure there's going to be some teams out there that you just want to bait the Astartes into a big trap. So just like, you know, like go go dangle a trooper that's taking some wild shots. And then like when they come out to try to deal with you, they present a target that now you can hit with your plasma gun or your sniper or, or like your Dark Lance if you're running the Elgari. 
Are you talking uh, elites versus vet guard or something like that? Uh, just kind of like in general, um, elites are going to be pretty strong and uh, just like have a plan to deal with them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, I think I think there's a bunch of different teams I've noticed have all a bunch of different ways of actually dealing. I know with vet guard, that was one of my first teams I played. Uh, ploy, I didn't see a ton of people really putting a ton of time into was combined arms. Um I was pretty bad with getting spotter stuff off, so I'd a lot of times I just get my spotter, use that silent to actually get the mortar barrage, get a shot on someone, and then from there I can just go and do um combined arms like a plasma gun or something like that. Actually get those yeah, reliability. When you need it. Yeah. Yeah, and like combined uh, arms like with all... grenades. Yeah. Also pretty strong. Yeah, and I mean, also, like, I mean, my, my main team now is Jaegers, and I'm like, I think a lot of it, with going against elites, like, I, I can't do a one-two punch. I can't just, you know, punch immediately. Um, but I do have ways, like, fallen kin tokens, depending on kind of getting that set up properly. Um, hidden engagement, if you need kind of long, if you're getting, to get, trying to get a bunch of shots off, the mines especially. Like, most teams have tools, you just have to learn your tools. Yeah, and like I mean, Jaegers, you can you can set up all those mines, and if they push through, they take some chip damage. Hit them with like a little like silent thing on the way in, and then like by the time they make it deep into their line, into like the elites, by the time the elites make it deep into the Jaeger lines, they're probably pretty battered, and you can start killing them with plasma knives. Well, the uh, the the new uh, mines are are even worse against elites, or they're even better against elites. They're worse for elites. Uh, they stop act. They stop actions. Yeah, so it's just like you yeah. run into it and it immediately ends your activation. Yeah, or it doesn't end your activation. It ends your action. What's important there is so if you charge, oh. you get stuck there because charge makes it so you cannot do a move or a dash. Um, but they can still shoot you in theory if they, they have main you. unless you're like consumed. Yeah. I mean, they they could shoot me, yeah, but like, they're if you set up your mines properly, you can get them hang out in the open and set them up in places where it's like, okay, you don't want to be there. And there's also the mental game of like, I'm gonna throw mines in places, and I'll like swap out an obvious mine for a non for put a non obvious one on a flank somewhere, and be like, oh, you're trying to run up on me with your skin thief? Not today. Yeah, that's <laughs> wow. That's that's very strong. Um, real quick, Ranger, if you wouldn't mind, take a moment yeah. to introduce yourself to all the listeners. Oh yeah, no worries. Yeah, I'm an uh, Ranger. Ranger. I uh, I play uh, locally in the in the Baltimore area. Um, I'm playing for about two years or so. Um, and it's it's been a uh, it's been an experience. I'm really excited for this next edition. I know a bunch of guys were trying out the new edition last night. Um, I played one last Hazav second edition. So. I'm mainly playing Jaegers now, but play a couple different uh, teams when I get a chance. I'm excited for Kroot, though, because that's one of my teams I love. It's, Ooh, yeah. It never got love. Did edition. you do... Uh, so I'm guessing you've done a deep dive on Jaegers. Have you also done a deep dive on Kroot? Uh, I've done some kind of looking at Kroot, and I think the big thing, the big thing I've noticed is that a lot of their big restrictions are gone, and I think switching the rogue ability to a straploy is huge. It's like, and instead of having it all the time and getting something else... I definitely think crew are going to be a you know fire and fade team with the able to change orders, um, relatively reliably, and that's kind of baked in. It's a it's a it's a thing that I've always wanted to mess with, but I just never had the CP. So like, and there's always other things that I wanted to do because crew did have the ability to change orders, but I just never really saw a good chance. But I think now with a lot of these restrictions gone, where I can you know move a pistol the the um the pistolier up, get some shots off, tuck in and change to a conceal order so they only get like one opportunity to shoot back yeah so with the change conceal order in the new edition can you walk us through where that comes from is that a strat ploy or is that their passive ability or like how does yeah. that work yeah so their passive ability i can pull it up right here is for um give it a crew where it is it? yeah i downloaded them all earlier today so their new faction rule is far stalker and the ready stuff each strategy phase, you can change the order of the three um, family Kim Man acronyms and not within control. And, and when it's said, your turn to cover every strategy them. phase? Yeah, but there's also another part of it when you can when you counteract. Okay. So when you counteract, you can change orders. It doesn't count as your counteract, but it's like your so you can still counteract again with them, but you can't um you can't like it's it's like you count that counts your counteract, like your option, and then your opponent goes again. 
Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, that to me kind of sounds like it. you should pose for some aggressive early trades and if you can like yeah. make it worthwhile and then you're like behind on operatives and then you can like have these like explosive counteract you know yeah. things going on um that might be an interesting outlook on the far stalker kin band yeah i mean screw I, I i love them as a faction they're i really want to plan i got all these plans to work on them but just teams just did not perform i mean i mean even Orion was trying them out and just could not make them perform at the level they need to because they were they have they can get you in the first half with be able to score, be able to put pressure on. But like as soon as the enemy gets close, that rogue ability just doesn't really work much because everyone's going to get two in shots off you and you're not going to get those extra cards. I mean, those it's good to have as an option against teams like Pathfinders and other kind of ranged teams where like oh you can't just reliably shoot me even when I am in cover, but they definitely feel much more like you can move up the board, you can do things, and you can force your opponents into situations where they don't want to be, and be able to kind of get out and do, do what you need to do. Yeah, it seems like they definitely have had quite a glow up. Um, do you feel the same way about the Hernkin Jaegers? Jaegers, I mean, as one of the later teams, I feel like they definitely, um, there wasn't a ton of changes, there's significant ones, but nothing really big. Um, one thing, um, I definitely feel like Jaegers are probably a little bit ahead overall. I think I mean, I've been playing Jaegers nonstop since uh, since I got the team. So I think with the Jaegers, I think the big thing is we're much more mobile. We're able to really get up the board and do things and put pressure on. I think the big thing is, you know, everyone forward deploys. That That's insane. I didn't think we'd get anything nearly like that. And also, scoring on turning point two is massive. Uh, playing Jaeger's second edition, a big part of that team is you need to calculate each of your operatives, where they're going and how they're doing things, or you're not going to get to your objectives. I mean, you have boards where you just can't reach middle objectives, even with your four deploy guys. You just can't reach them at all. Or you're within, like, an, sometimes tolerance is like an inch, where you have to get that inch in. And if you don't, if you do your angle wrong, if this piece of terrain in the way something else is happening, you're done. You just, you can't get to the middle. Even worse than Salvagers, where they shut down all your forward deployments. But in the next edition, I mean, so looking at the how they are doing the forward deploys, as well as the extra inch of movement is huge. It's going from four to five is, is massive. It's, but also, a lot of some, some of the team stuff got turned down, but I feel like in general, they're ahead. Um, I think big ones, uh, stalwart, not sword defense, uh, tough survivalist, that change, I feel like it's it's a side, side grade. Um, now it's just the first die that goes through. So there was ways you can get around tough survivalist. I know one really bad combo was I think the gnarl scar of the Felgor, the one with the uh, who can do a shoot in melee. Yeah, he could shoot you, miss everything, and that will use up tough survivalist. Oh, and then wow. he punches you for full. I had not yeah, because it was thought about that. Yeah, the old wording was doing the first fight or shoot action involved with you. So if you had a Jaeger and shot at you and missed every shot. It still used up tough survivals for the turn. Um, um it's just amusingly, the first, it's the first time Yeah, amusingly, a power sword could also just like bypass it because if you hit for, if you like strike with a crit, which goes from six down to three, and then a normal for four, they would survive on one. But if you hit with a normal, it goes from four down to two, and then crit for six, and they die anyways. Actually, so in the in second edition, that doesn't actually work uh, entirely that way because it's not the first die; it's any die. So if your opponent only gets one crit and they get a hit, you can tank the hit and then have the crit. You get to choose. Okay. But now you can't. So now you can't. So now it would work that way. It would work that way, yes. But the difference is, uh, the big thing is that now you can't get your tough survivalists used up by any chump shooting at you. So one like strategy was it, like you know if you let's say you have um like you know intercessor right it's all intercessor charge don't want to shoot then charge if somehow you can you know survive it and you, you, if you they they roll poorly you get the cover save and whatever um that won't use up tough survivalist and then you can have one of the incoming hits from the chain sword but so it's 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 a side grade more than a downgrade yeah. It's just there's there's different situations and scenarios where it works. But I mean the big thing is plasma getting getting taken down to four four standard damage is massive for us. So with Jaegers, your half point with Tough Survivalist is five. That is your number you don't want enemies hitting with. 
Um, so anything that hits on five normally, it will two shot you no matter what, even with tough survivals, because it has five has down to three and then another five gets you to eight, except for the Thane. Thane's at nine. So you need, you know, you can you can survive that. But plasma going down and being so prevalent was you can just nuke nuke you know, Jaegers of plasma guns. It was just it was bad. Now that they stand with four, you have to go hot to actually get that five. It's it's a big deal. Yeah, and going hot is like you can't command reroll your hot reroll, your hot roll, oh, yeah. and like, yeah, and it, it's pretty significant. It's it's like when you supercharge, you plan to take damage. Yeah, oh well, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. I, I feel like that's really a big big change, and I feel like I like. I mean, it's it's extreme. I do like divorcing the hit roll from the actual um from the hot roll. I think doing that in forty k was a huge benefit that I really liked. Because you could just like vet guard, right? And you, know, you can just BS it every time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I like that. Well, I think a big thing. Sorry. Yeah, I was just saying I like that too. Uh, go ahead. And I mean, another thing is a big change is uh, stalwart defense. So um, stalwart defense now works differently. It is no longer an Overwatch attack. So the word on that is key because it used to be with stalwart defense that it was an Overwatch shot, which means that. Um, so Jaegers have three operatives with silent weapons. You have the bladekin throwing knives, the tracker um, throwing axe and his hand bow, and the riflekin's sniper. Um, it's now a shoot action, but you still get the minus one to hit. But the important thing is you can now use it with silent weapons. Ooh, that's actually pretty huge. Yeah, I mean, the riflekin only gets the first one. But yeah, it's basically because that was a big problem. Is that A lot of times I have to use my Thane and keep him on engage and put him in a spot where he can kind of overwatch and basically be able to eat uh, to shoot the shotgun into the charge. It's not as effective anymore because Thane's not hitting on threes, so the twos, but um, still, I mean, it's 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 a good way. I have, I had gotten some good shots with that, but yeah, being able to do a silent weapons is huge. Um, the knife changes, I feel like, are... We couldn't get the four attack knives. It's unfortunate we're not getting four attack knives for everyone, but I mean, it's balanced. It has to be that way. But um, I think everyone be able to get knives, three, five lethal, five up hitting on fours with only three attacks. I think that's good. Um, a lot of times I've run in situations where, like, mid- late game, my knife guys are pretty much all dead or they're engaged elsewhere. So being able to get that spike damage is really nice. And I feel like losing initiative means I can get things like fallen kin tokens off much more easily. Fallen kid tokens are insanely good if you're able to really set them set up right. I think with only three objectives instead of the six, there's probably going to be at least one fallen kid token on every board whenever I play. Yeah, I'll trade you uh, my four attack choppers for your four attack knives. I mean, yeah, I I'll make that deal. Yeah, I mean the Jaegers the <laughs> it, it does make the case though. So the the warriors with the revolvers and knives because you can't just take a knife as an equipment and just that's the standard procedure was kind of you give your warriors shotguns as their main equipment, give them a knife extra. But now there's kind of play and talk about actually giving the warriors um the revolver and knife to give me get some melee flexibility. And I was looking into more of that in last edition, but I feel like even now, being able to get four attacks, and the revolver isn't bad. It's on fours, but it's three five. So, yeah, does it have any special the, rules? Is it fours. like like rending or anything? Uh, no special rules. Um, but it's it's still um, I mean, it's it's not terrible. I think it's the big thing was because uh, Jaegers, you could just take shotguns, knives, and revolvers. Revolvers were one one equipment point. Knives were two. Shotguns were three. So being able, so that's what everyone did. Is I mean, yeah, the, the revolvers were okay but the shotguns are really good and you just can throw you just use all your equipment points on knives and maybe a grenade or climbing ropes yeah i mean so. I, I was pretty much immediately on team give so i i what the way i did it is uh i all my warriors had knives and revolvers and then i could spend the rest of my equipment on giving knives to everyone so my entire team could use knives as a method to like have like sneak out more movement because like if if your main way to to get an extra couple inches is to charge, and when you get there, you've got a plasma knife. It's a it's a pretty good way to creep up on people. Oh yeah, I think a big big kind of reason that was caused there um, was because of um, the issues with um, with you only got one box. 
and there was enough warriors to make knife revolver warriors and shotgun warriors. And the kind of thing was, oh, it's all one back. So you don't get, you can't easily get number one. So yeah, they had to find ways of printing, proxying, whatever, um, just kind of make something to get those other warriors. So the kind of general general consensus was, hey, just give everyone shotguns, give them knives. That's just how it works for now. But now that we're getting our next another box and we're able to do more, I think that yeah, I think there's gonna be more play with revolver knife. There's gonna be more play with that kind of situation of where hey, sometimes I know I ran situations where sometimes I wouldn't get the shotgun off. You know, if I'm going against an especially aggressive melee team, if I don't get initiative, then I'm just like one of them is gonna get jumped. So being able to have a knife without having to spend equipment points and spend a knife somewhere else was tempting. Yeah. So I do like I am liking the look of the the firestorm shells as well, equipment wise. It's um, a blast one, right? Yeah, it's blast one, but it doesn't actually have the um so in the in the in the uh, last session they they were blast one, but they were two four lethal five up. Now they're just the standard profile. Oh, so, so you can get full four, four blast, blast shotgun. One. Yeah, it's only I think it's one per round, I think. But I think in some in some in the dark situations, I can see that being really valuable against like shooty hordes, where they're going to be kind of bunching up operatives around hatchways. There are a lot more like torrent one and blast one options I've been noticing in this edition, and it's it's really gives them interesting uh, decision making points. I think. And I think the big thing is kind of I mean, one thing I always tell new players is never use fusil aid. The only time I actually ever could see Fusilade even working is against old Jaegers or Jaegers in condition because you could Fusilade and basically knock off a bunch of uh, tough survivalists because you just have to make the shooting attack. It doesn't matter how many dice you throw. Um, the, the one you, use case for Fusilade last edition? Yeah, basically just if you, hit, if you can hit like two Jaegers, you can knock off both their tough survivalists <laughs> because the first time you shoot against them, they lose it. <laughs> That's like super niche, and I assume only a Jaeger player would have known that. And someone would break oh, yeah, a fuselade, yeah, not is. even know about it, and then, and then just be like, oh, whoops. Uh. Yeah, I realized that, like, yeah, recently. But, like, so, I mean, I think the big thing is, I mean, Torrent got changed. The Torrent doesn't require, you know, do the trigonometry of the strong or anything. And I feel like doing that versus fuselade and, like, having those different salvo profiles, I really do like that better as opposed to kind of you know, the way things are going earlier with kind of just, you know, splitting attacks. and Because, I mean, you just basically, your opponent will get double defense, dice, double cover. Just never worked out. Yeah. Physically, it was just awful. And I think I, I tried it once because like, I had opponent down really low out in the open and it just did not work. Oh, same. I tried it one time with a heavy bolter thinking, oh, I could kill these two wounded deals and I split it two shots into one and three shots into the other. Both yeah, of them it, lived. It, it was it's, never used it again. Yeah, it's one of those just those trap keywords. That I feel like it's like yeah, I think going to more of a torrent system where you can go, hey, you, like I saw with the um the Aqualon uh, Salar the the gun the gunslinger and the Crute gunslinger where you can kind of get multiple shots, but that was effective as single shot. So there is still value, and you know, not you don't have to kind of get multiple shots to get all your full effectiveness out. But it's an option, and it's a good one at that. So I I did I was able on Sunday to try on Into the Dark the sweeping profile for the dock pool. It did work. It, it it did work. Five attacks hitting on threes, lethal five up bolter with torrent one. Uh that was that was solid. But I don't see why where you take him on anywhere else except into the dark. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I feel like I think I mean I think like there's some situations, yeah. I mean, I haven't looked into orcs a ton. I mean, I actually am planning on making a team of them, but I was going to proxy them with the uh, the Reptilian Overlord Space Nam guys. Just make Catachans. Yeah. So, just Catachan commandos with a little, with the, with the Blackstone Fortress uh, rattlings as the distraction grot and make a little Catachan barking toad as my bomb squig. Ooh, like but, that. uh, that's awesome. Yeah, I was going to, I mean, I got a, I got a product working on, but it's, I got some other products on. I'm doing as well, so I just I gotta balance everything out. But yeah, I definitely feel like it's a positive way of doing those multiple shots, as opposed to just because I think Fusilade has never worked. Just it was never really good, and it was kind of felt like a lot of times where it's like just never really liked the the math on those at all. Um, I've got to say, you guys kind of got me thinking. Uh, so so Torrent has Lethal Five in Into the Dark and Volcus Stronghold. Yeah, and yeah. the Volcus Stronghold. Um, the way I was running intercession before was just auto bolt rifles against everyone for all the rerolls. 
Um, but oh, now, no. now just like I was like when I first looked at that, I was like uh, torrent one on everyone. I don't know if I like that, but I'm like into the dark. They're lethal five, and then also it's it's, it's another one of those instances yeah. where if you just like drown people in in a threat from every direction, you're gonna find someone even if it's like another elite player, and they're all like clustered up in one spot like even elites are going to cluster up on the door and then if you just like torrent shoot them with lethal five uh and and, like you know throw saturate on there because that's one of the chapter tactics you you can take and then you just run around and just hammer people with an insanely ludicrous inappropriate number of bolt gunshots oh yeah yeah i i definitely mean i'm I'm liking the 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 increase in tour i mean i'm i'm a I play a Salamander successor so like i i I love my flames love being able to, to do that kind of stuff and it's nice being able to see you know more, and they, I think definitely looking at the flamers. I mean, Jaegers don't have them, but seeing the changes of the flamers, I, I'm liking that a lot more. And I feel like those kind of multi shot weapons, because the way I saw it was, especially with Torrent, like it was the kind of thing where like any any experienced player is going to space all their models out unless they absolutely positively have to to prevent your shots. So it was a very much a um, it was a hurdle. It was like a it was like almost like a not not exactly a stat check, but kind of like it was kind of a sign of, hey, have you been playing this game a while? Do you know what you're doing? Um, if you can kind of space your guys out and get them to where, hey, I'm not going to get torrented. I'm not going to get blasted all the time. But then you have guys like the Jaeger, um, the gunner, where you can get a three inch blast. Where it's like, OK, that you're really not going to be able to deny very easily. Idea. We got all these. Um, oh, what are the new Infernus Marines running around? You could probably make a decent argument that the Pyre Blaster is just your auto bolt rifle now. If you're just getting in and you get that cheap, cheap. Uh, set of five oh, yeah. five dudes and you just need a captain so you can get like the start collecting a uh, 40k box get your five auto finger quotes auto bolt gun mans and then just like grab a lieutenant with a power fist and a plasma pistol and you got your uh you got your angels of death squad yeah. oh there you yeah. go yep that's no, a great I know, idea I, I know one thing i mean i was already planning on kind of because I, I I was working on an inter- intercession squad to kind of stop the project and they just I got some other things going on. I got some stern guard to to do. For, I'm basically doing the combo weapon for the gunner, but the other one um the other one's kind of just regular bolters. But um I do have the uh, heavy bolter guy I can use and just crazy rebase him up, magnet magnetize the bottom and get a 40 mil base for that. So, yeah, I mean I definitely think um it would have been cool. I think someone I think it's all in the one of the article was mentioned that you can, it would have been nice to be able to swap out the um the eliminator or the heavy intercessor for just a straight up furnace marine i think that would have been cool i think that's potentially you know some we can see maybe in the future is adding a couple uh random you know space marine models maybe like a hell blast or something like that to, to toss in there not having I, I having a space marine squads without like a special weapon in them seemed so wrong to me and i was always so upset that you you couldn't take like a heavy bolter or a plasma gun or a flamer or something like that in um intercession squad. So I'm glad yeah. to see Angels of Death at least get, you know, the heavy bolter again. Yeah, it's more of a functional design change how space marines work. It's they're not really as like internally flexible. They're more flexible in terms of different units and loadout, not inside the squad, which I mean eh, I'm mixed on. I do love my aggressors, but at the same time it's, it's not I, I would love to see a, a actual good um Gravis team, but I don't think we're ever gonna see something like that with aggressors, eradicators, all that kind of stuff. Yeah I, I mean, would be I would be down for an aggressors team. Honestly a, uh you could also Gravis probably team. I mean this is something I would do just run an aggressor as your Gravis unit in the Angels of Death. Yeah. Seems pretty yeah, cool. I mean he'll way underperform in melee. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean it's I'm that's what weapons get into is proxies are so much easy, or, or easy to use as long as you're clearing off it's what you're doing. So I mean I'm making like Harkaradons for Nemesis Claw. So it just kind of stuff is just Yeah, I'm like I I kinda wanna do uh Black Templar Blade Guard vets, but put them on 32s and then run them as like Hardy so they crit save on fives and duelist, and that kind of like captures the vibe of the shield. And then you just, yeah. you know, run around with a bunch of uh Blade Guard vets and chop people up. Seems like a cool way to play Space Marines. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I definitely think I, I look at the Angels Death Rules earlier and I was pleasantly surprised. And I think definitely a big one is being able to do the uh, shoot and fight kind of mix it up as well. I think that's going to be a big flexibility change because like I've run situations where like my um, 
like let's say I have like my uh, like an assault intercessor where I want with the grenadier especially where I want to be able to shoot and maybe throw a grenade as well or be able to and like and still like kind of cap a point or do something like that. So I think you know I think the that kind of Astartes keyword is is a nice change and kind of shows that hey they've been kind of picking things up and adding things adding things over time to kind of uh, basically they're they're taking notes as to what's working what's not working. Yeah, we've definitely seen that with a lot of stuff over time as well. I mean, as a here at Tech Main, I definitely see how much, you know, um, reanimation has changed over time and where it is now, or some of, like, the special abilities on stuff. Um, where, like, blooded are largely the same, crazily, but... I mean, yeah, I think I, was, I think some mean, like, I was one of, one of our little parties just got into Breachers, and it's like, yeah, I mean, Breachers have been a good spot relatively this entire time. They haven't really needed entire massive overhauls. I mean, I played Salvagers on release. Um, that was a really bad three months. Uh, I lost, I went, I think, zero, um, eight, and one. So, not a good time. That's dedication to keep at it at that point. Yeah, I mean, I tried them out, tried to do some things, and I made them try to make them work. I mean, I'm, I'm a dwarf player at heart, so like, I tried to make them work. I just they did not work. That seems to I be mean, just the story of Hearthkin at the at initial release. So many people jumped in and were like, "Oh yeah, I get squats back," and they're like unplayably bad. I can't do this anymore. I'm gonna just go cry. So I'm glad to see that they're in a, a so, solid place. We we were all we were about like proxying and modeling and you know how are you going to say this i get asked that for events um you know for like elf teams god too many times it seems every event i've got two players asking about it and my deal is always the same i'm not throwing like huge huge events and it would probably be different if i were but like for a casual deal man i don't know the difference between these things if you tell me that's a kiss and they all look the same. Well, guess what? That's a kiss. If you tell me it's a blade and it all looks the same, man, as long as it's consistent. And that's where I think we're going to have to, at least starting out, be a little, give a little leeway on people. Because not everyone's going to be able to go and buy two full boxes of a team to have every single option. Right. Yeah. And like hobbying is half the game. So like being all like gatekeepy about exact modeling um, when when clearly there's like a, a a good way that like, you know, shows good intentions and is easy for the other player to understand should just be encouraged even not just accepted, but encouraged. Yep, I agree. Um, how do you all feel about the removal of the painting score? And this is one. I'm I've gone I flip flop back and forth on it and I feel like I do it about twice a day is do I did I like it or do I think it kept too many players from playing but I, I wanted to get other people's thoughts on that while we're while we're all talking in one spot I I liked the painting score um and granted like our meta was pretty lenient with it Jason did you ever mark people off for that really i don't think i did yeah like for for me though like if it was someone that they're playing their brand new team that just came out or it's like a first time tournament player i'm not going to be and i think it gave a lot of i think it just came a lot to, to like to fiat on that like if you're showing up to a big event i want to see painted minis thousand um, percent yeah, that's that. That feels fair to the. That's just a respect thing to me to the player I'm playing against, right? If if you're gonna spend money, travel, and do this, I want to make sure that you have the best time playing against me. And in my mind, that means having painted models across the table from me. Now, I I understand I actually, not everyone's able to do that. Yeah, I actually struggle to visually tell models apart when they're just like primered, or when they're just gray plastic. And having them mm -hmm. painted so I can actually pick out different weapons is is really big for me. I don't know, like something in my brain just doesn't click on what what's what. So having them painted for me is actually a huge thing for identifying what I'm dealing with. I think a big thing is kind of the, almost the message is sending by removing it. And I feel like so 
locally, I mean, I play in a pretty competitive area. I don't know if you know, know the so far is Titan game, Titan hobby, games are obvious. Bunch of the uh, the Plaza Spam guys, you know, really, really good, talented players all play there. I mean, I'm playing with them almost every week. Um, but people, if you're playing a casual game, pain score isn't really a thing. Even if your models aren't painted, um, it's almost a community thing. Of like, hey, you know, hey, you do stuff together and do. A, I've been pretty bad in the past about not having models painted my or because I paint my head separately. I ran a lot of headless teams, <laughs> but I mean, it's something I've been working on personally and and working with and getting much better with, but. I think it comes down to, yes, if you're at an event, that should be a requirement to be at the event, if you're going to a big event. It's not a score thing. It's, it's a, just, you have to, you know, it's like, I think it's always someone about, it's like, if you, someone invites you to a wedding, are you going to show up in like flip flops and a stained t shirt and shorts? No, you're going to get dressed up and you're going to, you know, get, present yourself, you know, the way you want to be presented to this event and you want to put your best foot forward and this is kind of a respect thing for everyone involved everyone else is kind of expecting this bare minimum it's not just a playability thing it's more of just hey we're all here to have a good time have fun it's not just game pieces and that's kind of separates table of war game from something like you know a trading card game where they're just game pieces yeah i think that's actually a, a really good analogy there and uh if, if that's how all the event organizers and participants felt about it uh, I think it would just work well enough on its own. That was yeah, that very was... eloquently put. I mean, that, I hadn't heard it put that way when compared to like Magic the Gathering or a TCG, but when you put it up against that, that makes a lot of sense there. I think like, someone was uh, discussing, I think, in one of the channels I was in, they're like, well, if they're coming from Magic, and they're like, hey, I'm getting to help. I mean, they're like, generally, just not understand the whole, hey, like, is why is like painting a requirement thing? It was more of a kind of genuine question. And it's like, well, it's just because it's Halo you know, War Gaming is a different kind of thing. People take pride in their models, the creative side of it. It's a portion of it. I don't think it should factor into actual competitive score. Like, I mean, the painting score is just, are you painting or not? Yes or no. But it shouldn't factor into, hey, one point for bare minimum, two points for like good painting job. I think that should never be a score and factor because, as like I think someone said, it's, some people just, they're not as skilled as a painter. And I don't think that should discourage you from like, oh, well, you did just as well as someone else, but they did some better edge highlighting than you, so you lost your game. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And I think the accessibility thing for me is a lot of, like, I definitely get the arguments with when I used to play full-size 40K, right? Where having a full-size, full like, 2,000-point painted army is a immense time investment yeah that's, that's an expensive task just in money not even factoring in time commitment to it i mean oh that's... yeah I, I i spilled like at least three paints of null oil last time i was trying to paint the 40k force yeah um yeah, yeah. so but a kill team is i mean a, a time commitment to get painted but it's not a you know, full time job. It's not undoable for to get it done. Yeah, it's oh, not yeah. insurmountable. It's, 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 it's a climbable mountain. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it is also, especially with Kill Team being a much smaller format, a skirmish, you know, format where, or not even a skirmish, more of a tactical format, um, where you know you don't have many models, but also like, I think, I think I met just in the, it was that same kind of channel of like. So let's say you know someone's just getting started and they have an event coming up, right? And they need help getting their model painted. I think anyone in any com good community would have people say, "Hey, we'll help you get you know where you need to be. We'll help you get you know take some time to help build the community up, get their bare minimum." I think you know, three colors and a base and a something on the base is not an insert, not too difficult to do. With you know you rattle can one color, you paint the guns and they paint uh, accent color somewhere and just put a little bit of basing paste. It's not you know insurmountable, but I feel like it shouldn't be the there is a barrier. I think it's important to recognize that there is that barrier, but I don't feel like it's a particularly insurmountable one or difficult one, especially if you are in any real good community where people are really taking care of you and helping out. I mean, I've seen instances when I was playing, I used to play War Machine and I saw an instance of like a community sit down and be like, hey, our buddy wants to play this tournament team for this big event, so we're all gonna like power paint a whole army for them overnight. Yeah. On like release day, yeah, or something like that. Like, 
And yeah, I mean, it was, oh, it was doable. Yeah. And I think a lot of it's, you know, looking at your community, your local scene and being, you know, that's where you want to be. I mean, we have someone, we someone who drives like I think almost like a half hour or more every Tuesday night to play with us because it's a much better environment to play in. And they have people that, you know, bring, yeah. always bring in, you know, at least worked on models, painted models, have a good competitive atmosphere, good, good vibes, good community. It's like, I think that's a, a core part of it, especially when it comes to painting. It's like some people, you know, painting is not as big of an issue. And I know for me, it was something that was, it was just, I just wasn't good at it and I was anxious about messing up and doing all these things. So I just kept putting it off and off and off. Then I, the reason I actually got my models painted, because I had to for an event. I buckled down, got them done for the event, and I'm like, wait a minute, I'm actually like not terrible at this. Yeah, that's a point for me as well. Like, I need a deadline on stuff to get it done. Otherwise, it'll just sit half painted like my Lionel Johnson is model is uh, because I don't play that. But if <laughs> if there's a deadline, like, oh wait, I need some Tesla Warriors to be able to run in this uh, or Tesla Immortals to be able to run in this tournament in case I run into a horde team. Like, I'm gonna get those painted up pretty quick. Um, yeah. But I also understand that some people, it's an anxiety point of like, oh my gosh, I have to do this. Um, and being understanding of that, especially when it's a new person, is is a really big part. So I, I mean, definitely, I feel like if it's a if it's a new player, their first event, and there's just not enough time or capacity, or whatever, to get it done. I mean, yeah, I understand if they're not paying the models. I think that's you know under, understandable. I think anyone playing against it is like, yeah, I mean, if it's a small local event, yeah, that that that's fine. I wouldn't you know, be too too much of an issue. But when you have the people that are coming each week with unpainted models or like unfinished models that, and you're like consistently when it becomes a habit and no progress is made, that's when it's a different deal. Hundred percent. That's, that's when it, and I feel like I mean that's that does happen in some communities and groups, but I feel like it's that that's not if you're playing a painting store because you just don't want to paint, that that's a different story than oh I'm having difficulties. I want to be ahead of painted army, but I'm just having difficulties getting there. Well, that is all we have time for today, friends. Thank you for coming on, and thank you, listeners, for listening until the end. If you want to participate in the conversation, join the Discord. You will find the link in the episode description. Uh, Who knows? Maybe you can find yourself on an episode as well. If you love what you heard and you're looking for more content from us, you can find some of our content on Goonhammer as well as YouTube. Uh, Stay tuned for that as well.